It's the best place to be. Well, you missed that right there. We, that was nice to have another little chorus there. So I, was, uh, I knew the song was ending, and I realized that I needed to put my watch on Do Not Disturb so I don't get distracted during the sermon. And so I was trying to get it, you know, I was forgetting which button to push to get it on there, and I was fiddling with it, and Brent was giving me the look. <laughs> it's time. And so my wife patted me on the legs and said, it's time. And so I stood up to go, and you took off with another course. <laughs> no, you don't have to apologize. I thought it was great. Uh, well, this morning we're going to continue talking about Ruth looking at the book of Ruth, and I think that this morning, if we'll lean in to this story, I think that God has a word for us today. And so, let's just take a moment and invite the presence of the Holy Spirit, invite the Spirit to have His way, because He's already here. Come, Holy Spirit, speak to us. Come, Holy Spirit, breathe upon us. Come, Holy Spirit, and kindle in our hearts the fire of your love. Amen. Well, if you'll recall, if you were here last week or if you watched it online, uh, the book of Ruth is just this beautiful short story. It's the story about a woman who is an outsider to Israel. It's the story about a widow from Israel. And it's the story about how God acts in ordinary things to redeem, to restore, to make new, to establish and secure a future for the nation and indeed redemption for all the world. I want to take just a moment to kind of recount the story in case you're not quite familiar with it. So the story goes like this, and you can find this in the Old Testament uh, of uh, the Bible. The Old Testament is what sometimes we call the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew Scriptures. This is the story of the people of God and God's work in the world leading up to Jesus. And so stashed right there in the Old Testament after the book of Judges, which is an account of when Israel uh, went through a cycle of sin, oppression, and deliverance. Sin, oppression, and deliverance. Running after other gods, and then they would be oppressed by an enemy, and then God would raise up a deliverer. It was also a time of moral relativism. It was a time when there was no king in the nation, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes, is how the author of Judges put it. And Ruth follows right after that, and in fact opens up within the time of the judges. And it centers on this one family, a man by the name of Elimelech, who doesn't last very long in the story, but he's an important character that stands in the background. So Elimelech and his wife Naomi, there's a famine in the city of Bethlehem, which is ironic because, remember, Bethlehem means house of bread. There's a famine in the town of Bethlehem, and so they leave Israel to go to the nation of Moab, which was an ancient enemy of Israel, at times oppressed Israel. But they went to Moab, there they prospered. Unfortunately, uh, there they prospered. Their two sons, Kilion and Malon, uh, found Moabite women to become their wives. But then disaster struck as Elimelech dies while in this foreign land. And then the sons, Kilion and Malon, also die. And when Naomi is left with nothing, she returns to Bethlehem. And her two daughters-in-law go with her. She tells them, hey, don't come with me. There's this dialogue. One of them goes back. Ruth stays with her. But when they make it back to Bethlehem, they are impoverished. They are in great need. They're in danger of starvation. They don't have what they need. And uh, Ruth has to go and basically gather up food that's left behind the harvesters and what happens in the story though is that Ruth just happens to end up in the field of a man by the name of Boaz who is what's called the kinsman redeemer 
Now what that means is under the law, the law said that if a, that the land of, when you owned land in Israel, you, if you sold it, you weren't to sell it forever. Um, and if you were poor and you had to sell land, then a redeemer, someone in your clan could redeem the land for you, okay? Boaz is a member of the clan who would have responsibility to end up paying some money that would take care of Naomi and Ruth. Ruth eventually, you know, there's a whole, we'll talk about this here in a few minutes, but Ruth and Boaz, they hit it off. Naomi says, hey, this is going to work, and sets them up. They get married, and this end of the story is wonderful. People say Naomi has a son, and Naomi is restored, and Ruth is welcomed in. And then, if you'll remember from last week, the end of the story is that the son of Ruth and Boaz is named Obed, who his son is Jesse, and his son is David the king. Okay? And then, of course, the, the great descendant of David will be Jesus the Messiah. Okay, so you got the story in a capsule. So refreshing you bringing you on, online here. So let's go back and let's walk through just a few points of this story and lean in and listen to what the Spirit might be saying to us. So first of all, notice that when um, Naomi returns to Jerusalem, how Ruth returns with her. And I want to read this passage to see what's happening. Because we're going to find something out about grace here. Look at this. Ruth chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Naomi has said to um, them twice now, to her daughters-in-law, go back home, I don't have anything for you. After the second time, the one daughter-in-law, Orpah, leaves. But then the third time, she says this to Ruth, and Ruth responds this way. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. Now here's what's striking about this. Ruth is a Moabite. Born and raised in the nation of Moab, an ancient enemy of Israel. Moab was known for serving gods that demanded human sacrifice. It was a terrible, dangerous nation. And Moab, because of the way that they treated Israel, the law actually prohibits Moabites from being counted as part of the congregation. Deuteronomy 23.3 says, No Ammonite or Moabite may enter the assembly of the Lord, even to the tenth generation. None of them may enter the assembly of the Lord together. And yet Ruth is a Moabite who is wanting to go with Naomi back to Bethlehem, a land she hasn't known, a people she doesn't know, a God that she hasn't known. What is this that's going on here? What is happening? Something has arisen in the heart of Ruth that has stirred her and attracted her to Naomi and Naomi's people. Now what was it? Was it maybe because Ruth was raised up in a home that taught her good manners and, and loyalty? Perhaps. Was it that Ruth just happened to be one of those people that was, dis, that was predisposed to loyalty and kindness and faithfulness? You know, you just meet some people that way. They're just sweet people. Maybe. Or maybe it was something about Naomi's family that attracted Ruth, the way that they lived out their faith. Maybe it was the way that they practiced Sabbath. Maybe it was the way that they prayed to the covenant God of Israel. We're not really sure, but what we know is that something stirred within her to take her past this point of just being polite to actually going all the way to accompany Naomi to Bethlehem. What is that that would happen? You know what I think it is? The Spirit of the Lord was moving on Ruth's heart. And this brings us to one of the first things I want to notice in this story. 
is that grace means that God always takes the first step toward us. Grace means God always takes the first step toward us. There's no reason that Ruth should have desired this, and yet she did. There's no reason that Ruth should have wanted to go this way, and yet she did. Something moved her heart. It's grace. It's grace. Grace. Grace is why you're here today. You may have thought that you got up this morning and thought it was a good idea to come to church. Well, it was a good idea. But where did that idea come from? No matter how you trace it back, you're going to find out that it was God at work in your heart bringing you to where you are today. You know, we we say sometimes, we'll say, well, you know, doesn't the Bible say, draw near to me and I will draw near to you? It's in James, right? Doesn't the Bible say that? Draw near to me. So God is telling you, you take a step and I'll take a step toward you. But who said it? God did. You see, God always takes the first step. The desire there are in your heart, there are desires that are stirring on the inside of you. There are hungers that are stirring on the inside of you. It's a desire for a life that flourishes. And I don't mean just, you know, all of the things that we tend to think of as Americans that we tend to categorize as this is a prosperous and flourishing life. There's nothing wrong with those things. But I'm talking about there's something inside of you that desires something even beyond that. A life that is full, a life that is rich, a life that is free. That is God moving in your heart. Those desires are grace moving in you, drawing you to what God has for you. You know, one time I was flying to, um, I was on a flight to Phoenix. Uh, Actually, I was headed out to California, and we had to stop over in Phoenix. And I was sitting in the same row as this uh, young woman named Amanda. And I got to talking with Amanda and uh, asked her, you know, what what is it that she does? And she was in the process of studying to become a a nurse, an ER nurse. And uh, actually, she was already doing that. And I... I asked her, I said, so, you know, what, what drew, you, drew you into that? You know, what caused you want to do that? And so she was telling me how she likes to, you know, put pieces together, you know, just really kind of help and all that, just really help bring things together and, and healing in the brokenness. And I think that's great. And so then she asked me what I do. And so I told her. And then she said, well, what drew you into that? I said, well, thank you very much. <laughs> And so we began to talk about Jesus. And Amanda said to me at one point, she said, you know, I, you know, she grew up in church. She wasn't in church at the time. And she said to me, she said, you know, I just, it just seems like I ought to be able to feel my faith. You know, I just want to be able to experience it. It ought to be something with me that, you know, that I feel that. She said, I just, I, I would like to feel that God is near. And I said to her, I said, well, Amanda, do you think that maybe... The fact that we're having this conversation is a sign to you that God is near. And Amanda teared up and she was done. That was as far as she could go at that moment. And she said, I I don't want to talk about this anymore. I said, okay. But I've prayed for her ever since. Because I believe that the Spirit of the Lord was moving on Amanda's heart and had orchestrated our appointment together for that very purpose. And the reason I tell you that story is if you'll look, if you'll scan the environment of your life, I really believe that you will find all kinds of signs wherein God, grace, and mercy is working in your life. And if you will notice, if you will listen, you'll see that God is at work in you. So I ask again, what is it that's stirring in your heart? What is it that rising up, even as you hear this, there's these wisps of hope, these wisps of a dream for freedom in your life, for joy, for a flourishing of your life, a life with God. That is the Lord drawing very close to you.
and working with you and in you. And one of the things that it teaches us is that there is nothing about you that is a barrier to grace. There is nothing about you that is a barrier to grace. I sat in a service one time where a minister was telling us, you know, he said, hey, he was talking to college students. He said, nothing can keep you from God. Nothing can keep you from God. Nothing can keep you from God except your sin. Except your sin. And I, I, I think I understand what he was trying to say. He was trying to say that if we turn away, you know, if we reject God, okay. But I wanted to stand up and say, actually, since we're celebrating Good Friday, it was a Good Friday service. <laughs> I, I didn't. But I wanted to stand up and say, actually, since we're observing Good Friday, apparently not even your sin can keep you from God. <laughs> because God will overcome it. Nothing about you, nothing, not your past, not what you've done, not where you came from, not where you are, not where you got up and said, I wanted to be tomorrow. Nothing about you is a barrier to God's grace. Nothing. And then you see, as we watch what's happening, as Ruth comes with Naomi, we find out that Ruth, or that, that God was moving in Ruth's life. And he was drawing her into his care. In chapter 2, when Ruth goes to glean the harvest, because the law said, the Jewish law said, that when you harvest and you're getting the grain, if anything falls behind you, leave it. Leave it for the poor who would come and pick it up. And so Ruth apparently knows something about this. And so she says to Naomi, let me go and glean grain and Naomi says go and she goes and Ruth just happens to go to the field of Boaz whom the scripture describes as a man of substance or a worthy man depending on the translation you're using and he's also like I told you the clansman he he belongs to the the clan of Ruth or excuse me of Naomi and so Naomi goes in and, and finds this out, or, or <laughs> Ruth goes in and finds this out. And as she talks to Boaz in the field, Boaz is impressed with her, finds out who she's related to, and Boaz makes this statement to her. He says several things, but he makes this stunning statement to her. And he knows that she's a Moabite. He knows this because he's asked around. The men have told her who she is. <clears throat> And all through the scripture, she's referred to, in fact, as Ruth the Moabite. Ruth the Moabite. Ruth the Moabite. Which is code for Ruth the outsider. Ruth the one who's not supposed to be here. Ruth the outcast. Ruth the enemy. And he says to her in verse 12 of chapter 2, He's talking about what she has done for Naomi. And he says, the Lord repay you for what you have done. And a full reward be given by the Lord. It's a covenant name. Given you by the Lord, the God of Israel. Under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Now this idea of the wings is going to be important. Because this word, it means wings. But it also, it's, a, it's one of these Hebrew words that has multiple meanings to it. So it can be wings, it can be the, the skirt of a garment, the, the um, outer robe, it can be the, the, a tent, it's you know, living under the awning of the tent. And so what Boaz himself is saying to Ruth the outsider, Ruth the foreigner, Ruth the outcast, Ruth the not supposed to be here, Ruth the enemy, what he says to her is, may you find shelter in the Lord's tent. Come on in to the Father's house. Right? May you find shelter under the Lord's tent. May you, the outcast, find a place under the Lord's wings. And so Ruth begins to work in the fields with Naomi. And here's the next point I want us to note that this tells us is that God is always 
in the business of drawing in the outsiders. God always draws in the outsiders. Listen, the Father wants no one outside of the kingdom. The Father wants no one outside of his house. The Father's desire is that all the outsiders come in and become insiders. The Father is that there are no, the Father's will is that there would be no outsiders. One of the phrases that, I I never got to know Pastor Des, who you all talk to us about, and what a lovely man, but one of the favorite sentences that I've heard from him is, he's always drawing bigger circles. Always. Jesus is always drawing people on the inside. And here's the thing, that's important to remember because we have a tendency to view ourselves primarily in terms of disqualification and outsidedness. People, and even churches, even groups of people, can begin to consider themselves disqualified for whatever reason. Because of failures, because they don't compare, because they don't, or because they do compare themselves to others, they don't seem to live up, they don't seem to match up to other um, expectations. We have a tendency to exclude ourselves from the grace of God. Well, you know, it's good for that church down the street, but that doesn't really count for us. We're just, we're just Bethesda. We're just this church here on 47 night. It just doesn't apply to you. I don't know, you know. We've been through a lot. I don't know. I don't know. God always draws us in. Always. Bethesda, the Lord is drawing us in. No matter where you are at, the Lord is drawing you in. So Ruth, as she goes on this experience... She works with Boaz. Ruth finds mercy. Ruth finds mercy. Listen to this, verses 13 through 17 of chapter 2. And remember, mercy, we talked about last week, mercy is acting on behalf of another, especially when they cannot act for themselves. So listen to what happens. Then she said to Boaz, If I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me, And spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. Remember this whole bringing in on the inside? At a mealtime, and at mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers, and he passed to her roasted grain, and she ate until she was satisfied, and she had some left over. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her. And also pull out some from the bundles for her and leave it for her to glean and do not rebuke her. Can I just say that if Boaz is having to tell them not to rebuke her, I suspect that the men were wanting to exclude the Moabite. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. That equals about 30 pounds. This is a good day. It's a good day of work. (laughs) Okay, a few things that happens here. First of all, when Ruth sits down with Boaz, she eats until she is satisfied and has some left over. Remember this from last week? Naomi sees only emptiness. And yet God is acting to fill. Ruth eats until she's satisfied and then has some left over. Secondly, Boaz instructs the workers to pull out handfuls of grain. He didn't just say, let her glean. He says, and as you're, as you're harvesting the barley and you're bundling it up, You know, Ruth is coming behind and getting what you leave behind. I want you to actually reach in there, and every now and then, I want you to take out a handful and just drop it behind you. 
on purpose. And so this is how Ruth ends up with so much. I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. But then we move on to, so hang on with me. Because then we come into chapter 3 where things get really weird. Weird. So when Naomi discovers how this is going with Boaz, she's, I think Naomi has hopes, but nothing is happening. They get to the end of the harvest time. And in fact, some have thought that it might be, in fact, that Boaz, um, we moved from barley time into wheat time. And so you, it could be as much as seven weeks have passed from the beginning of chapter two to the beginning of chapter three. And nothing's happened. And so mother-in-law decides to get to work. And she says, we got to find you a home. You remember that from last week. we got to find you a home. And so she says, here's what I want you to do. And she tells her to do something that is really interesting. She says, Ruth, <clears throat> it's time to uh, bathe, anoint yourself. This means put on perfume. So I want you to clean yourself Wash your face, comb your hair, put on some perfume, get the dress on. Perhaps she's still wearing her morning rags, I don't know. Get your dress on. And then I want you to go down at the end of the last day of they've been threshing it out, they've been winnowing the, the grain from the chaff. They're going to celebrate, they're going to have a feast. And after Boaz has had his fill, and he's feeling pretty relaxed and pretty good. Watch where he goes to lay down. And then I want you to go. Follow him. And when you get there, I want you to pull up the blankets, maybe even his cloak, his robes a little bit, and I want you to uncover his legs. It says feet, but the Hebrew there includes more than feet. And then lay down. Now, this is weird. Let me just put it, let me just set you at ease. That's not how my wife and I got together. <laughs> I, I, her parents are Alabama bred and born. And if they had known, if, if she had tried that, <laughs> well, if you're Southern, you know. Remember this, there, there's so much to unpack that, that we can't get into. Let me just make a couple of comments about it. There's so, remember that Boaz, under the law, potentially has a responsibility to care for Naomi and Ruth. And in fact, the law was even such that because the land was to be held in the family, if a man dies without heir, his kin was supposed to take the wife so that they could raise up an heir in the name of the dead man. So that the land could remain in the family. Now, we don't, that was, that was the Jewish law. It's not the Christian law. Certainly not the law of the land. Okay, so don't go getting any ideas. Um, but this is what so Ruth or Naomi is trying to prompt Boaz to his responsibility. Ruth lays down, and in the middle of the night, Boaz turns around. The scripture says something startled him. Maybe he was shivering with the cold because, you know, his legs are uncovered. <laughs> it's cold. <laughs> it was warm, but now it's night. And he turns around, and the, the, Ruth, the Bible says, and behold, <laughs> there was a woman. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's what I would have said, too. <laughs> And he says, who are you? <laughs> and Ruth steps out, and Naomi had said to Ruth, this is interesting, Naomi had said to Ruth, he'll tell you what to do. What I love is how grace comes, and yet grace works with us. God's grace works with us, so that Ruth's agency is never denied. Ruth doesn't just lay there and wait for orders from Boaz, Ruth says, spread your garment 
over me. It is Ruth. Spread your cloak, your wing. Remember I said that wing? It's that same word. Spread your wing over me, your garment, your cloak over me. Now, she wasn't saying, I'm cold, give me your blanket. What she was doing is she was flipping some rolls here. Because this was how a man proposed marriage. Ruth proposed to Boaz. <laughs> this is gutsy. <laughs> Ruth steps out and asks. Now here's what impresses me. Ruth the Moabite, the foreigner, the outsider, the outcast, the, one, the enemy, the one who's not supposed to be here. Something in her heart has risen up and Ruth the outsider asks for what she needs. Everybody would say that she has no right to ask. She has no right to expect, no right to ask, no right to request, but something in Ruth has captivated her heart and has caused her to expect that she can receive, and she asks. What are you prompted to ask for? What do you want to ask for? What is it that is stirring on the inside of you that you want to ask for? Friends, that is the Lord. And he's saying, ask. You may be telling yourself, you don't deserve it. You don't have a right to it. That you're not supposed to ask for it. But the Lord is saying, ask. This is grace. Boaz accepts the proposal. Accepts the proposal. Boaz says, yes. <laughs> now, here's the thing. He has to go through a legal process because there's a, another kinsman who is closer than he is. And so he has to go through this legal process to make sure to see if that kinsman will do what he's supposed to do. But Boaz has a feeling that he won't do it. In fact, Boaz in chapter 4 sets it up in such a way that the man won't do it. Because he gathers them around and he says... Naomi, your kinsman, has some land, and you're, it's your job to redeem it, to pay, pay some money so that they can survive. And, and the man says, I will redeem it. Sure, add it to, I will, I will buy it, I will take care of it, till the land, take care of it for everybody, take care of Naomi. And he says, okay, good. You need to know that Ruth the Moabite comes as a wife with it. At which point he says, no. <laughs> uh -uh. And then Boaz says, okay, then I'll do it. Here's what I want you to catch. All through this chapter 2, chapter 3, and into chapter 4, we've been seeing something about the grace and the mercy of God. Now, Boaz himself has faced a crisis. He's faced a crisis that night when Ruth came to him. What is he going to do? Is he going to take advantage of her? Is he going to turn her away? Is he going to call her an immoral woman and tell everybody about it? She and Naomi have risked everything this night. And Boaz himself faces a crisis. What will I do? Will I remain bound by my perception of who this woman is and her nation? Will I may remain bound by my traditions? Will I, be, will I remain bound by what everybody tells me I ought to do? Will I remain bound to the expectations of people around me? Or will I see beyond this to the spirit of the law, which is love? This is the challenge that Boaz faces that night. Will I, will I be a good, respect, re, good, respectable man in the community and drive the woman away? Or will I risk it all in the name of love? This is what he does. And this is mercy. You see, all along we've been finding mercy because They've been going beyond the bounds of the law. The law said, leave 
don't pick up what you accidentally draw, drop. Don't pick it up so the poor can come behind. Boaz says, deliberately drop stuff behind you. It's mercy. The law says, redeem the land. Boaz says, I'll take the woman. The law says, raise up an heir in the name of the dead one. Boaz says, I'll marry her. Boaz goes beyond the law and beyond the expectations. This is mercy. Listen to me. Mercy crosses boundaries. Whether they are social boundaries or ethnic boundaries or financial boundaries or boundaries of the past or church boundaries, whatever it is, mercy crosses boundaries every single time. Mercy will cross the boundaries that we draw. Mercy will also cross the boundaries of what's expected. Oh, it's expected that I give. Mercy says give more. It's expected that I forgive. Mercy says forgive and forgive again. Mercy crosses, but mercy goes beyond. And here is where this is just to me stunning. If mercy crosses boundaries and mercy goes beyond, then mercy is lavish. Mercy is abundant. Mercy is more than enough. And mercy can be so abundant because it springs from the character of the Almighty, the Shaddai, who is more than enough, who is faithful to the covenant and keeps his promises to the end. Mercy springs from the conviction that the world is full of the grace of God. Mercy is rooted in a commitment to the vision of God that is marked by abundance and more than enough. This is what mercy does. And every single time that we have communion together, we are celebrating this fact that mercy has come to us and that God has provided more than enough. Because when we receive communion together, we are celebrating the fact that God did not withhold his only son in order to save the world, to save a wretch like me. We are celebrating the fact that he ongoing continues to feed us and provide us from his heavenly table of mercies. Mercy goes beyond. You know, this morning as we were in worship, and we were, as we were singing the songs, I just felt the Lord begin to stir in my heart something that I hadn't planned to say or, or planned to do. But I, I just felt it stir. One of the things that I think binds us up and trips us up so much is a spirit of fear and scarcity. Fear and scarcity. Starts with scarcity. If we believe that everything is scarce, resources are scarce, love is scarce, friends are scarce. If we believe that everything is scarce, we will be trapped in fear. And when we are trapped in fear, we will fight and oppose to get what we... James, chapter 4. Why are there wars and fighting among you? Is it not because of the passions in your own heart and in your own flesh? You want and do not have. And you don't have because you don't ask. And when you do ask, you ask amiss. You ask till you can spend it on your own passions. What is he saying? He's saying you become driven by your own needs so that when you ask, you don't ask in the sense of, God, you are abundant. What can you do to open up my life and flow through my life to others? You ask only for what you need, for what you want to satisfy for yourself. And when you ask for what you want to satisfy for yourself, you're not thinking about anyone else. And that's why you have wars and fights among you. Because you have become consumed with what you want for yourself. And so then you fight for it instead of asking for it. 
I think that some of us here this morning, and I, we, when we talk about fear and scarcity, we often equate that with financial. We usually go financial. It can be. But let's not stop there. Let's not stop there. It's not just money. It's relationships. It's the ability to embrace the other. It's the ability to say, these doors are open to everyone. It's the ability to live up to our name, house of mercy. If we are a house of mercy, then we are a house that crosses boundaries. We are a house that opens the doors and says, we don't care about your labels. We are a house that welcomes all. We are a house that says there is more than enough. We are a house that says when God moves, he moves for everyone. We don't believe in the limitations that the world puts upon us. I want to do something. Would you stand with me? And this is not at all how I was planning on ending this. <laughs> but I'm just going to go with what I feel in price. I think, I think that some of us have really been struggling with that sense of scarcity. And it's bound you in fear. And it's paralyzed you. You've been wondering why you haven't been able to move forward in the Lord. You've been wondering why you've felt bound up or why your relationships keep being sterile. I think that it's because you are viewing the world in terms of limitation and scarceness. And because of that, you're only demanding what you want for yourself to spend it on yourself and your passions. And if there's an invitation from the Lord in, us, in this this morning, I think the invitation from the Lord is to say, open your eyes, for I am the God that brings water from a rock. I am the God who rains manna down from heaven. I am the God who makes the bitter waters sweet. I am the God who brings his people to a land of milk and honey. I am the God who takes a few biscuits and a few sardines and feeds multitudes. I am the God who would not spare my only son in order for you to be redeemed. I am the God who makes all things new. He is ever creating and recreating. And if you could just with your heart open up your eyes for a moment. And if, actually, let's do this. Close your eyes. And in your imagination, I want you to view the landscape of your world. Your life, your world. It might be that you see barrenness. Maybe it appears to you in terms of rocky wildernesses or desert sands. Maybe it's a concrete jungle. But can you imagine if you would open up your grip off of control the life that might come, the waters that might flow, the luscious vegetation that might grow. Can you imagine your heart growing? Can you imagine being free of fear? Can you imagine being free of scarcity? Lord, we offer up our hearts to you. And if you at all in any way did, 
you're here this morning, and if you at all in any way identify with this or desire for the Lord to move in this way in your heart, would you just lift your hands as a symbol of offering up your life, yourself to the Lord? Thank you. Lord, we offer ourselves up to you. Forgive us for seeing you as less than enough. Forgive us for seeing ourselves as somehow disqualified or outside the scope of your mercy and grace. Forgive us of thinking of how you move for everybody else, but you don't move for me. Forgive me, Jesus, for trying to take over things, and as a result, I'm choking off the life. Open my heart, Lord. Now I just want to address, I think that there's a spirit that goes with this. And I just want to address that in the strong name of Jesus. I speak to the spirit that lies, that says there is not enough. There is not enough resource. There is not enough love. There is not enough room. There is not enough grace. There's not enough mercy. I speak to that lying spirit in the name of the Lord Jesus. Your hold is broken. Holy Spirit, come. Blow across this room. From the balcony, down on the main floor, across the stage, in every service, come Holy Spirit, like a mighty rushing wind, and blow the lids of scarcity off the top of our heads. Tear off the bondages. Tear off the limitations. Tear off the labels. Tear off the constrictions that we placed upon ourselves. Release us, Lord, in life. The story ends with Ruth getting a new name. She's been called Ruth the Moabite, Ruth the Moabite, Ruth the Moabite, the outcast, the outsider, the enemy, the hostile one. And when Boaz takes her to to his own as his wife, the people of the city say, may Ruth be for you like Rachel and Leah. Who were they? They were the mothers of Israel. It was from Rachel and Leah that the 12 patriarchs came that became the 12 tribes, the nation of Israel. May Ruth the outsider be a mother of Israel. (laughs) She's no longer an outsider. She's no longer an outcast. It doesn't matter. The labels are ripped off. The identities that they had placed on her are ripped off, and she's given a new identity. She goes from an enemy of God and an enemy of the people to a mother of Israel. The Lord renames you. And in Matthew chapter 1, when the apostle Matthew lists the genealogy of Jesus... Most of the time, he just says the dad. But four times, he includes the moms, which is a sermon all its own. And one of the moms is Ruth. He doesn't say Ruth the Moabite. It's just Ruth. She's in the people of God. I want to give an opportunity this morning if you, in any way, you have said, I feel like an outcast. I felt on the outside. I felt on the outside of God's love, God's kingdom, God's house. Can I just say that the house is open? The doors are open. The kingdom is open. And it's for you. you say, well, you don't know what I've done, but Jesus does. And he still says, it's for you. You don't know where I've been, 
Jesus says it's for you. And the prayer team is going to come. If the prayer team could come, and if you're you're saying, "I, I want to give my life to Christ, I want to come on in on the inside, would you come? Maybe it's not that. Maybe you would say, I'm, I'm struggling. I'm struggling with this being on the outside. I'm, I'm struggling with this in myself. And I just want you to pray that I would feel the grace of God in my life again. Then would you come? You're just saying, I just, I want to be free. I want to walk in God's generosity and abundance in his mercy. Would you come? The Lord is here and he's moving And he turns no one away. Jesus said, no one who comes to me will I ever cast out. No one. You are more than able. that about breaking off the spirit of fear and scarcity um, I just I just sensed something happen in the room and I think you did too I, your response that I just something happened so I'd like to invite you to lean into that this week okay you have to lean into your freedom right? It's not a matter of just, well, okay, that was good, and then you just go back, right? 
you have to lean into that. So would you continue what we did last week? Every morning, would you ask the Lord to help you to see where his grace is? Every morning. And then when you go to bed, t- take a moment and look back over the day and say, where was your grace? Name it, because it will be there. I promise it will be there. I promise it will. Name it and give thanks for it. Would you continue that? If we do that, we're going to lean into the freedom that Jesus gives us. And you know what? Anything is possible. Anything is possible. Father, thank you for being with us today. Thank you that as we gathered as your people, as you gathered us as your people, you witnessed to your presence through testimonies. You witnessed to your presence through the singing of praise and the prayers with one another. You witnessed to your presence through the word of life. I pray that you would be with your people by your spirit throughout this week. Help us to remember to look for grace. It's all around us. It's scattered all around us. Give us eyes to see. And now, my friends, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. The blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you. Remain with you always. Amen. Go serve the Lord.